So here's a question for you. How much energy is required to heat 100 grams of ice at negative 30 degrees Celsius to steam at 300? So hopefully you saw my last video on heating curves and cooling curves. But if you haven't, here's the gist of it. So we're going to deal with a heating curve. Let's say this is 0 degrees Celsius and this is 100. So we're starting at ice at negative 30 and it's going to take energy to heat up ice. And then it's going to take energy to melt ice to liquid water and then heat liquid water from let's say 0 to 100 and then vaporize liquid water into steam and then heat up steam from 100 to 300. So Q1 is the energy that's required to melt ice. Q2 is the energy that's required to well let me start over. Q1 is the energy that's required to raise the temperature of the ice. Q2 is the energy that's required to melt ice into liquid water. Q3 is the energy that's required to heat up liquid water from 0 to 100. Q4 is the energy that's required to vaporize liquid water into steam. And Q5 is the energy required to heat up steam from 100 to 300 Celsius. So we got to find these five Q values. Q2 and Q4 is associated with a phase change. So you can find an answer using this equation, n times delta h. And q1, q3, and q5, those are associated with a temperature change. So you can calculate those values by using mc delta t. Now there's one thing I need to give you, or you could look it up in your textbook, and that is the enthalpy of fusion for water, which is about 6 kilojoules per mole, and the enthalpy of vaporization which is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So if you want to pause the video and try this problem, feel free. So first, let's calculate Q1, the energy that's required to heat up ice from negative 30 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius. So that's going to be mc delta t, so the mass is 100. The specific heat capacity for ice is 2.03 joules per gram per Celsius. And the change in temperature, we're going from negative 30 to 0, so that's positive 30. So this is 100 times 2.03 times 30. So that's going to be 6,090 joules. Now for Q2 and Q4, I'm going to use a conversion process. But basically, I need to convert grams to moles and then take the moles and multiply by kilojoules per mole to get the energy in kilojoules. So in that case, it might be wise to convert our value for Q1, which is in joules, into kilojoules. To do so, divide it by 1,000. So this is going to be 6.09 kilojoules. So I'm going to save that answer for later. Now let's focus on Q2. So we have 100 grams of ice. And ice is basically H2O. And the molar mass of water is 18 grams per mole. So we're going to divide 100 by 18. So the unit grams cancel. So now we have moles. Now let's multiply by 6 kilojoules per mole. So the unit moles cancel. And so this is going to be the amount of energy that's required to melt 100 grams of ice. So it's 100 divided by 18, which is about 5.56 moles times 6. So this is going to be about 33.3 kilojoules of thermal energy. Now let's move on to Q3. So we're going to use this equation again, mc delta t. So the mass is still 100, but this time we're dealing with liquid water. So we need to use the specific heat capacity of liquid water which is 4.18. Now this is in joules per gram per Celsius. Because it has joules, our initial answer will be in joules. And the change in temperature, we're going from 0 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. So that's an increase of 100. So it's 100 times 100 times 4.18. And so this is going to be 41,800 joules. And let's divide that by 1,000 to get it in kilojoules. So that's 41.8 kilojoules of thermal energy that's required to heat up 100 grams of water 
from 0 Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius. Next, let's move on to Q4. So we need to use this process again. So we're going to start with 100 grams of ice and then divide it by 18 to get moles. And then multiply that by the enthalpy of vaporization, which is 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So 100 times 40.7 divided by 18, that's equal to 226.1 kilojoules of energy. So now the next thing that we need to find is Q5. So that's a temperature change problem, so we've got to use this equation again. So it's the mass, which is 100, times the specific heat capacity of steam, which is 2, and then multiplied by the change in temperature. So we're going from 100 degrees Celsius to the final temperature of 300 Celsius. So that's an increase of 200 degrees Celsius. So it's 100 times 2, which is 200, times another 200. So that's 40,000 joules. And if we divide that by 1,000, that's going to be 40 kilojoules. So now, we have the values of Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5. So to calculate the total energy for this process, it's simply the sum of those values. So we're going to add Q1 with Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q5. So all we got to do is add the highlighted values. So it's 6.09 plus 33.3 plus 41.8 plus 226.1 plus 40. And so the total energy is 347.3 kilojoules. Now notice that the bulk of this energy came from the vaporization of liquid water into steam. And so it takes a lot of energy to vaporize a liquid into a gas, as you can see. If we divide 226.1 divided by 347.3, I mean that gives us a ratio of 0.65. So 65% of the total energy of this process was due to the vaporization of liquid water into steam. And if you think about our coolant system, let's say if you're hot and it's a hot sweaty day, or let's say if you're in the desert and it's dry outside, but it's also hot. When your body temperature is very high, your body begins to sweat. And so as water evaporates from your face into the dry environment, it cools you down. So one mole of water will take away 226.1 kilojoules of thermal energy away from your body. And so the evaporation of water, or the evaporation of sweat, is an effective cooling process. A lot of thermal energy is released when you sweat out water or uh, sweat. Now the next thing you need to keep in mind is that this is a positive value. So as we heat up ice, 100 grams of ice, at negative 30 degrees Celsius to steam at 300 degrees Celsius, we need to put energy into ice or into the system. And so therefore, that's an endothermic process. And that's why the total heat energy was positive. So that's dealing with a heating curve. Now, if you're dealing with a cooling curve where you're going from, let's say, steam to ice, and let's say the values are the same. This is 300, and this is negative 30. Now, our answer was, I forgot what it was. I believe it was 347 kilojoules per mole, approximately. Now, the magnitude of that answer will not change if we reverse the problem. The only difference is the sign will change. So as you go from a high temperature to a low temperature, 
energy is released from the system, and so it's an exothermic process, and therefore Q will be negative as opposed to being positive. So make sure you take into account the direction of where you're going. If you're going from a low temperature to a high temperature, then it's an endothermic process, your final answer should be positive. If you're going from a high temperature to a lower temperature, then your final answer should be negative. So keep that in mind.